Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. This is the second part of the first lecture, which is what will I be doing here and is this the course for me? We left off part one of lecture one with some general advice for studying history. Basically, much of it boiled down to don't get stuck in the details and don't try to memorize information, at least not for my class. I'll finish up part five here with more specific advice for understanding historical sources and how to approach them, as well as getting you started on actual work for the class. You will need to learn to distinguish between sources made by or around the folks that you are interested in and analyses by other historians. This brings us to the how to approach history reading. You are looking at Trinity College Library in Dublin, Ireland. If I were immortal, I would want to while away my immortality in this place or the Bodleian at Oxford. But short of immortality, there is no human who can read every book, even just the books in this one room. So one plan of action we will need in a 10-week class is to have a strategy for approaching readings in history. The first step is to figure out whether you have a primary or a secondary source or something that's a bit of both. A primary source is something produced at the time the historian is studying. Primary sources are often text or writing based, so things like court records, diaries, land deeds, and household accounts, but not always. For example, photographs can be a primary source as long as they were produced at the time the historian is studying. When we get to the second half of this course, I am a primary source. Secondary sources are scholarly works produced by researchers. In other words, secondary sources provide the insights and data that earlier historians have already created. When you want to figure out whether you have a primary or secondary source, start by asking yourself a list of questions. What type of thing are you looking at? Where did you find it? And the answer could be on a Canvas course site. That's perfectly valid. And why are you looking at it? And the answer to this could be because it was assigned to me. And as you see on the slide, you can get to a page explaining primary and secondary sources under the syllabus on our Canvas site. Historians develop an understanding of the past through both the analysis of material produced in the past at the time we're studying primary sources and by building on the work of other scholars, secondary sources. Primary sources always require some detective work to understand. People writing things like diaries, letters, and newspapers imbue their writing with their own worldview, their own assumptions, and their own motivations. Sources created in the time period of this course can be particularly tricky to interpret as they emerge from historical contexts that are so close to our own. Vocabularies may seem familiar, but have had quite different meanings in the past. Understanding the lives of most folks requires detective work in what may seem to be irrelevant primary sources. So hospital files, court records, construction maps created by individuals with substantively different goals from historians and their contemporaries alike. We'll look at two books so that you can see how to decide whether each is a primary or a secondary source. The particular copy of the book that you are looking at on the slide here is recent, but the text inside was originally published in 1861, long enough ago that you would start thinking primary source immediately. When you find out who the author was and why they wrote the book, you know this is a primary source. The author is not a recent scholar, and the book presents the story of the writer's life and a critique of slavery. This book is loaded with information, but it was not written for the purpose of conveying the results of scholarly analysis. Primary sources are the materials that historians analyze, and you will be learning how to tackle primary sources throughout the quarter. This book was published in 2010, so it's fairly recent. The author is an historian and, in fact, 
is in the history department here at UC Davis and is my major advisor. This book examines the past, the 1930s, but it is an analysis of why things happened the way that they did. This work is based on the analysis of both primary and secondary sources, and it is, of course, a secondary source. I will offer you secondary scholarly material through the quarter. So we will go through reading how to read history in this lecture. And I'm asking you to practice in section with the Henneford reading. I've shown the top of it here, and I've shown you where to get to it on the Canvas site. And you have it under files and also under the module. We start this course right after the American Civil War. So the reading, the Henneford reading that you have here gives you an opportunity to see the type of work that historians do and to practice how to read a secondary source. But it will also help you to get oriented to what was happening in U.S. history right before this course starts. So going back to strategies for tackling history reading, if you have a secondary source, move on to part B. Determine what type of secondary source you are looking at you are most likely to have one of the following, an historical monograph or book. Mono means one and graph is writing. So a monograph focuses on a single historical question. You may have a chapter from an edited volume, or you may have a paper that appeared in a professional journal. That's the Henneford reading that you have this time. If you have a secondary source, it will never, 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 never be a novel. Novels are works of fiction intended primarily to entertain the reader. Almost all legitimate scholarly works have been peer-reviewed. We don't get to publish whatever we want. Publishers and editors review work to make certain that it is actually valid work that contributes to the field before any secondary source comes out in print. Be aware there are things that are not secondary sources, but that can fool you. These include articles in popular magazines, newspapers, and websites. Doesn't mean they're worthless, but it does mean that you approach them differently. Your approach and expectations will be different for these than for scholarly historical sources. We'll talk about how to use these types of sources another time, maybe. Now, if these were produced, these shown on the slide, were produced around 20 or more years ago, some of these could be primary sources for the time period covered in this class. Assuming that you do have a bona fide secondary source, what do you do next? Remember, you are an honorary historian as long as you are in this class, and historians cannot read everything we need, much less everything we want to read. I think that this picture was probably taken in a bookstore, but to be honest, it could be easily be my home. Spouse periodically complains, which changes nothing. Historians know that other historians cannot read everything all the time. Historical works, whether monograph, chapter, or paper, are constructed with the idea that the reader is going to gut the text, and they're written to try to make that gutting easy. What exactly is gutting? It is not, absolutely not the same thing as skimming or scanning a reading. Just go with me here. This analogy is ridiculous, and I pushed it to ridiculous limits. But I have found that the ridiculousness makes it easier to remember the process. I'm going to spend some time on gutting because it will make your life in history classes both more pleasant and more efficient. So gutting. Regardless of the length of the text, a secondary historical source is a fish. Step A in gutting secondary sources in history is to look at your fish. Don't ignore titles. They can be quite informative. And you will often see that history titles start with something catchy, in this case, disorderly women. And then they have a subtitle that tells you what the book is actually about, social politics and evangelicalism in revolutionary New England. And this da 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 followed by what the book is actually about is a really common feature. So don't ignore it. It will help you get oriented. Who wrote 
quote the book or the chapter or the article that you have. What is their scholarly affiliation? Are they trained in history or in another academic field? When did they write the book or paper or chapter? The gutting method is the same, so I'm likely much of the time to just use book from here on. How long ago was your text written relative to the time that you are reading it? There will always be at least three levels of historical context to keep in mind for a secondary source. The historical context being analyzed, what it seems like the thing is really about. The historical context in which the text was written, the writers and scholars' historical context. So history doesn't invent everything new, and it doesn't discover some absolute objective truth. So the history that we write changes over time with historians and with the world around them. And we have to consider our own historical context because we are enmeshed in the making of history. Back to gutting your source. Step B, scale your fish. Look at the table of contents if you have a book. It will tell you more than page numbers. Read the names of the chapters. Is the book primarily organized chronologically, meaning by time, or thematically, meaning by analytical basis? Just looking at the table of contents, you will be able to see how the author has organized their book and the type of story that they are going to tell. This also works for papers. Look at section headings if the paper has them. And an early hint, this also works for my class as a whole and for each of my lectures, hence the outline at the beginning. Step C, cut off the head of your fish, meaning read the beginning or introduction of your text. Sometimes, like on the slide here, it is already labeled introduction for you. Otherwise, it's usually the first chapter for a book or the first paragraphs for a paper. Once you have read the introduction, you should know the when, where, who, and what that the book will examine. And you should have at least some idea of the why question the author will be answering with their text. If this is all new to you, then you will be more clear after the next step. Don't just move back through your fish from the head in. And don't read your history book in order from the introduction through chapter one all the way to the end of the book. Instead, cut off the tail, meaning read the conclusion of the book. Sometimes it's nicely labeled, like the one that I gave you on this slide, and sometimes you have to figure it out. It's the last paragraph or two of a paper or short book, and the last chapter of text in most books. So not necessarily an epilogue, but the last chapter, and you kind of have to scan over it and check to be sure which it is. By the time you finish the conclusion, you should know the why question the author has answered in the book and what their answer is. In other words, the big argument that the author is making. The argument is the entire point of historical writing, and it's a little bit too bad that they call it an argument because it sounds like we're constantly challenging one another, and that's not really quite the case. The argument is the thesis, is what we have to add, and it does sometimes change the way we look at things. But the whole point is not to cut other people off. The story told and the sources cited are the evidence and experimental results to historians. An argument is not an opinion. An argument is not just what the historian thinks about a topic. That might be a starting hypothesis. But in history, the argument represents the conclusions that an historian has drawn based on close study of their available data. For some texts, you will only ever gut them to this stage. So say you want to go to an author's talk. You don't have time to read their entire book. The talk is in an hour. You just found out about it. But you want to have enough knowledge of their book to get something out of their talk and to be able to talk to them should the need arise. So getting this far, the cutting off the head, cutting off the tail, is far enough to orient you for a talk. Assuming that you are moving on, though, Remove the viscera from your fish. Viscera are the internal organs, or appropriately here, the guts. For a book, removing the viscera means doing a mini gut on each chapter or section. Read the chapter and section titles, the topic sentences, which are the first sentences of each paragraph, 
and the first and last paragraphs of each chapter section. This gives you the how, how the historian has backed up their conclusions. The author anticipates the questions an informed reader is likely to ask before that reader will be convinced by the main argument. This step in the gutting lets you figure out the lines of logic and reasoning that the author is using in answering those questions. The process of gutting again, is not the same as skimming or scanning. In gutting, you do want to pause and think. It's not to get through it rapidly, but to get through it efficiently and relatively quickly. So you will want to pause and think as you work through the text, and you do want to read some parts of the text in depth. Once you get to this step, step E, you know enough about the text to find material for a paper or for a discussion question quickly and efficiently. Don't have to memorize it. You just have to know how to find it. If a text is extremely important to your research interests, you will take your fish apart more thoroughly. You will want to cut out the fillets, meaning figure out what type of evidence the scholar is using. For historians, evidence is drawn from a mix of primary and secondary sources. You will need to consider what the type of sources used can tell you about how your scholar will go about proving their points to support their argument. For people new to history, footnotes, I have them circled in blue here and then I've gone in close on this other picture on the slide. Footnotes seem like a bizarre vestige of outdated historical presentation, but for historians, the footnotes are our materials and methods section. They can lead us to other secondary sources or to new archives that could be incredibly useful to us. You will sometimes encounter end notes. End notes are exactly the same as footnotes, but they are put at the end of a paper, chapter, or book instead of at the foot or the bottom of the pages. Decide whether you want to cook and eat any part of your fish. This means that you decide if you want to read a text or any part of it closely right now. This is a personal calculation you will make based on your own interest, reason for reading, time, and energy. You can always freeze some or all of the fish to eat later. In other words, you remember enough about the book to know it will be useful to you and to keep it or notes on it where you can find it when you want it. Dead tree books you put on shelves or stacked on the floor, as some of us do, and electronic material archived with notes will allow you to find what you need a year or more later. You cannot remember everything in every book, but you can remember which book or paper had that information or argument that would be really useful to you right now. If you are still going with your text, cook, eat, and enjoy. That means read what interests you the most or what will help you answer a question more closely. Dig into those details that I made you skip over before. If you follow the basic rules in order of preparing a fish, you will enjoy it much more than if you try to drop it whole and raw into your mouth. If you follow the basic rules for reading history, you will enjoy history classes far more than if you try to read every word of every text from beginning to end. I am not having you buy a textbook for this course, but it is really useful to have a reliable source where you could get larger context or background quickly. And for that, I am going to recommend using Yop, and I will go over what Yop is and how you know what to read out of. There is a section on course readings in the syllabus. I've already covered some of it, so I will leave most of this for you to read on your own. Remember that you can access most readings through files or more directly through the homepage for our course under whichever module you are on. I'm going to explain the Yop reading. There will be YOP readings for each module, and they're outlined in blue here. So this is what you'll see on the modules or homepage. We will be using the American YOP, a massively collaborative open U.S. history textbook, and I've given you the website for this class. 
I found that it summarizes a great deal well in a short space. It's easy reading. My modules will tell you which chapters I recommend that you read. This is your big picture overview of American history. I will never test you on specifics from the textbook. The textbook is there to give you a reliable source of information and context for class material. Each chapter in American Yop has links at the end to relevant primary sources, and I've shown one of those here. Primary sources, again, are material created during the time period that a historian is studying. I will also include a pop culture package, which will be a set of primary sources with each module. I may or may not ask about some of the primary sources, whether they're in YAP or in the pop culture package that you have access to in quizzes. If I do decide to ask about one, I will make it very clear what you need to read. Your TAs may choose to use any of the primary sources for discussion section work. The best way to know what to read for section is to go to section or to contact your TA as soon as you can if an emergency arises. Note, some of the readings are primary sources, meaning that they were created at the time period we will be studying. And what that means is primary sources including, included in the readings often contain problematic language and characterizations. These should be thought about critically in light of the lecture material and should not be reproduced uncritically in papers or projects. I will let you read the advice about taking notes on readings on your own. It's longer than this. It's in the syllabus. Your term project will be an exercise in communicating history that you discover for yourself. I will leave you to read the section of the syllabus on communicating history for yourself and jump on now to what will I be choosing a project for this class. Going back to the section on grading, I will go over the categories of assignments that I skipped before, went through quickly before in part one of this lecture. Category one, lecture quizzes, three points per quiz, 20 quizzes, up to 60 possible points. Each week, there will be two questions posted, the first at some point on Tuesday and the second on Thursday. You can find these questions in the quizzes sidebar or navigate to them by using assignments. Your responses should incorporate material from the lecture and any strongly encouraged reading were relevant, meaning if the question asked you about a reading, primary or secondary, then you should draw on that in your answer. Responses should be at least 350 words, and they are due by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. on the week they are posted. People ask me sometimes, why are they both due on Sunday? And the answer is that a certain percentage of the class needs to wait till the weekend to answer the questions. So rather than having a ton of different due dates, you can turn them in as soon as you finish them, or you can turn them in at the end of the weekend, as long as you get them in before midnight on Sunday. Don't be concerned by the fact that Canvas forces me to label these questions as quizzes. I am interested in having you engage with the material, not that you get some correct answer or deliver deathless prose. As long as your response is of the required length and it is absolutely clear that you listened to lecture and did any relevant reading were asked for, you will receive full marks for the quizzes. Entirely random musics unrelated to the course material or overly short statements may not get any points. I will also deduct points if I find that you have used Wikipedia or the like for your answer. There's just no point in taking my class if you are only going to do what you could do in your spare time anyway. Category two, section. Section is your key to success in lower level history classes at UCD. Do not cheat yourself by not going to section. Your TAs are all well qualified. They are the ones who will guide you through analyzing readings and will answer most most of your questions on course material and final project assignments. Your TAs are the ones who will know how your work develops over the course of the quarter. Your TAs decide how many of your 20 section points you will receive as 
well as grading your coursework that you submit on Canvas. Now, here's the thing. If your TA has no idea who you are, or if you miss important directions on assignments that your TA gives in section, you'll just earn fewer points in the class. You'll do less well. Category three, and this is where we're getting to the big project. Formal writing stages. There are five possible due dates with up to 16 points possible on each, up to 80 points. I went over the grading and rules for category three in part one of the lecture one video, so you can review it there or just read it in the syllabus section. Now I'm going to skip here to the stages of the term project. And just a quick reminder, do not confuse due dates with stages and vice versa. This will make more sense in a moment, I hope. I will be talking more about timelines in the last part of this lecture and actually showing examples in the coda to the lecture. So in stage A of your project, you will be making two timelines. The first timeline will cover the full arc of this class, 1865 to 2000. This timeline must have 10 entries indicating major events. One's interesting at the macro history level, and I'll talk about the macro level in the next lecture, but things like wars or presidential elections or assassinations of well-known figures. These 10 entries should be spread out over the entire timeline and not all bunched up, say, in one decade. Then you will choose a time period on which you would like to focus for the remainder of your final project. Your second timeline will cover only the time period you've chosen. This time period should not be more than 20 years, and it must have ended before you were born. You must clearly indicate the boundaries of the shorter timeline and explain what it is that interests you about that time period. So examples might be the red or lavender scares of the 20th century or the removal of the U.S. from the gold standard by FDR in 1933 or the proliferation of black codes in the decades following the American Civil War. This second timeline should also have 10 entries. All of these must be relevant to the topic that you have chosen. Stage B, you will be choosing two primary sources from the time period in your second timeline. There are many options available online and through the UCD library system, so don't panic. Your TA will help you if you ask. I will help you if you ask. In stage B, you will be doing what most students want to do rather than an analysis because it's what you've been taught to do. You will be writing a report on the historical context that will help you and later readers or listeners or viewers to understand and analyze your primary sources to make sense of them. In stage C, you will decide the format for your final project and create a rough draft or a detailed description of how you will explain the results of the analysis of your primary sources. Note that this time it is not just a report. You will need to think about what you can learn specifically from the primary sources that you've chosen, given the historical knowledge that you've been building over the course of the quarter. And again, the point is not that you know how to do this now, it's that you get a chance to practice and experience this. Now, for the format of your final project, you will be choosing one of the following, a formal analytical history essay. Say. This one has the least possibility for creative input, but if you are planning to major or minor in history, understanding the structure and conventions of the formal essay for history, for the discipline of history specifically, may be useful. You can also do a podcast. By this, I mean a recorded audio presentation, and you will, of course, need to make the recording accessible to your TA. You can do a video essay or YouTube video. This this one is probably the most fun, but I recognize also that it requires the most tech. A video will be more interesting if you include at least some relevant images or graphics, as opposed to only showing yourself talking the entire time like a news reporter. As with a podcast, you will need to make your video accessible to your TA. The last possibility is an infographic, and I kind of went back on forth on offering you this format. In some ways, it's the most difficult of what I'm offering you. If you choose this, you must be very, very careful that you are presenting your analysis of your sources and not just a report about them. You will need to be able to share this with your TA, of course. 
Stage D is your final project, bonus stage. You will have noticed that there are only four stages, but five possible due dates. In order to complete all four stages by the fourth due date, week A, you will A, have to have submitted something for all of the first four due dates, and B, have gotten the go-ahead from your TA to advance to the next stage on the first try every time. So reminding you from part one of this lecture, you don't have to do all the stages, but you do have to do them in order. And whether you repeat a stage or move on to the next one depends on the number of points that your TA gives you and your TA's recommendation. I expect that most people will either need to repeat at least one of the stages, because again, if you knew how to do everything already, what would be the point? Or some people, many people often choose to skip one due date because the rest of the life gets of your life gets in the way. I recognize that my class is not the only thing in your life. So the fifth due date is to allow for that. And again, remember, you're not required to get through all four stages. But for those who get a 15 or 16 on the final project on the fourth due date in week eight, you will have the option of presenting if you've done a paper or infographic or sharing if you've done a podcast or video your project in one of the lecture discussion times in the last week of classes. So not finals week, but the last week we meet as a class. At this point, if you have gotten through the four stages, you have to have had 15 or 16 points, which means you will have accumulated somewhere between 48 and 60 four points on the first four stages and probably closer to the higher level if your TA has consistently moved you on. Chances are good that along with quiz and section points, you will have already secured the grade you want by the 10th week, unless that's an A+. The bonus stage here is intended for folks who are hardcore about the material or the class, or sometimes it happens that there are people who skip too many of the quizzes to get the grade they want. So this is another chance to get points. The maximum points for due date five, week 10, is still 16 points. And finally, you will need to start history, any history, the class, your project, anything with a timeline. This is where I will explain why you need to do that and give you some pointers on how to do that. This is a pretty standard horizontal timeline. I've got the end points marked at 1850 and 1930. And in this case, I've divided the timeline evenly and marked the timeline in equal intervals representing 20 years each. I have said that strangely, but hopefully it makes sense to you. I chose the end points and intervals here to keep track of Asian immigration and U.S. government immigration laws. For each event, I've marked the year and event, and then noted how this is relevant to the focus or theme of the timeline. This lets me see at a glance what came before what, so which events may logically have contributed to later developments. Each event can only be influenced by the events that came before it, not by anything after. Nothing is heading towards a particular goal. If there were a fully predictable sequence of events in the past, then we would be able to see the future now by the same logic, but we can't. We've no idea whether the invasion of the Ukraine is going to develop into a world war. People in 1882 had no idea how World War II would influence U.S. government attitudes to Chinese immigration. This timeline is vertical. It really doesn't matter whether you go horizontal or vertical, as long as you are clear about your starting and ending dates. Here, that's 1900 to 1950. The period is divided evenly into 10-year intervals that are labeled, and then each decade is divided into two-year intervals indicated by the horizontal text, but not labeled. This timeline has major events like the stock market crash and the beginning of World War II. I put the U.S. presidents on the right so that I have at a glance an idea of what was going on in American politics at the time. Much of history doesn't actually happen in single big events, but rather in developments over a period of time. So on the left, in the three colors there, I've used lines that thin out as something tapered off or that get thicker as something becomes more common. For example, although married white women started entering 
in wage labor with World War II in greater numbers, it was not as if none of them had worked in previous generations. So that is represented here by the line that thickens. Now, the presidents over here on the right are really only useful to me only if I know what was going on during the time each one was in office. But when I started studying American history, I really didn't have a clear idea of that yet. So I made a timeline with something that interested me and where I was already familiar with change over time. My hobby is period costume, not that I get any time to spend on it anymore, but I have no trouble remembering which fabrics were used when, as well as changes in shape of the different body regions with clothing. Show me a sleeve like this, especially made with a full skirt and made up in silk more, and I know that I'm in the 1830s without even thinking anymore. I already had some idea of what society was like at that time. I could just go over and see Andrew Jackson, and things would start to fit together in my mind through images rather than only having to memorize dates. You may have an interest that will work for you like cars or weaponry. If so, this is a technique to consider when making a timeline. In my lecture videos, I will give you key points at the end so you know what I wanted you to understand from the lecture. So here are the key points for lecture one, both parts one and two. You should explore the Canvas course site to make certain that you can find everything. Grading policy, assignments, and most basic course information are in the syllabus. Familiarize yourself with the different parts of the class syllabus, and if you would like clarification on anything after that, please ask. You can reach me by sending a message using Canvas or email me at katiegettleman at ucdavis.edu. And again, what Watch out for the spelling of my last name or it will not get to me. Don't feel like you have to read everything that I offer you to do well in this class. In life, we rarely get to do everything that is asked of us, much less do everything perfectly. This is a good class to practice figuring out what you need to do to get something from the class and how much you want to do and can do on any particular topic. In order to do well in the class, you will need to watch most of most of the lecture videos. That's the bottom line. Anyone teaching a broad period of history has to make choices about what to focus on. We cannot do it all. When it comes to assessing your work in our class, we don't care if you got great things from the internet, true or not. We want to know that you are thinking about the material that we've chosen to present, and you won't know what that is without watching lectures. If you could, there would be no point in taking the time to create lectures. Know how to distinguish between a primary source, one created in the past during the period that you are interested in, and a secondary source, which is an analysis of something from the past done by a scholar. Know how to gut a secondary source so that you understand the analysis presented by the author and don't get stuck in unfamiliar or, as the case may be, familiar details. Start thinking about what interests you that you might want to focus on for your term project and how you might want to share what you learn. Understand how to read and create timelines so that you know which events came before the time you are interested in. Actions and events arise from previous actions and events. We cannot see what the future holds for us, nor could people in the past for themselves. Historical events and actions make the present, and the present was not foreordained. For example, sometimes you'll hear people say something like, oh, the Civil War was inevitable, or World War I was inevitable. Well, they were not inevitable. It, they did become more likely over time as other events happened and certain decisions were made, but until they happened, they were not inevitable. Now, this is something that's only in the first lecture here, and this is answering that question, is this the class for you? I've tried to be straightforward about how I approach both history and grading in this class. Not every teaching style is a good fit for every student, and this is a good time to consider whether you will enjoy my class. Know that the class is inverted. All lectures will be on video. Live class times will be for questions, discussion, conversation as you desire. Most people really like this system. 
but about one person out of every 75 does not. If you are that one person, it's better to realize it now. My grading is structured to focus on helping you think about my course material, not whether you know more details than another person. You are not in competition with one another for grades. You have to pay attention to the aspects of history that I am presenting. You do not need to agree with me on everything or on anything, but you do need to engage with my material and not with Wikipedia or the like. Otherwise, why am I even here? I really enjoy teaching history, and I especially like UCD students. I learn a great deal from my students every term. So feel free to get in touch with me and set up a Zoom or in-person meeting. I do not have a healthy office space. I have respiratory issues, but I am happy to talk to people after class most days this quarter. Just grab me. The coda today is going to show you a variety of timelines, so it might be helpful to watch today's if you want to. Coda means tail in Italian. It's derived from the Latin word for tail, cauda. In music, a coda is an addition at the end of a piece or movement added onto the basic structure. In ballet, a coda is usually when the dancers for the different parts dance across the stage after the performance and are acknowledged individually or by group by the audience. In literature, a coda is essentially an afterword or follow-on. I usually put a coda after the key points of a lecture. Partly this is because history is depressing and it's really hard just to end on key points that are depressing. You may not feel that way. You will never be responsible for anything that I put in a coda. For this coda, I'm going to share some timelines that other people have made. You might note the theme of each timeline and what information the creator has chosen to present on it, meaning also what they decided to leave out. You can also think about which styles you like or perhaps why a particular style strikes you. The timeline on the left here comes from Ford and the one on the right from Audi. These timelines are for types of interior lighting. The one on the left is attractive, but on the other hand, it's not particularly informative. Not having any dates, we could tell the sequence, but really nothing else. The rather standard timeline on the right with the blue typing on it is extremely informative, although not as much fun. These timelines present European armor. The one on the upper left gives a general overview from 1100 to 1610. The artist has sacrificed an evenly divided timeline in order to include the images. The one on the right is just for the development of European breastplates from 1100 to 1700, and this is a vertical timeline. The creator has dealt with the issue of including images with a regularly divided timeline in an interesting way with this kind of S shape and pieces coming off. The one on the bottom left is quite specific. It is limited to Italian cuirasses of the 15th century. Here we have apples. On the left is a timeline of apple development for a single year. The letter and com <laughs> the letter and number combinations here here probably indicate time, but since I don't know how to interpret them, I can tell the order or sequence, but not exactly when to expect each stage of development. The timeline on the right is a very fairly classic vertical timeline, giving us information on the history of apple cultivation in Montana from the 1840s. 1920. Here we have very focused timelines relating to developments in forensic science. The bottom one is DNA typing of forensic samples. I got my master's for this sort of work in the 1990s when countertop, not just PCR, but countertop PCR was new. And Spouse worked on the Human Genome Project. And you can see when that sort of started and when it sort of ended here. The top timeline shows the history of a particular forensic laboratory. And finally, shoe timelines. The timeline on the left is actually fairly useless when it comes to information, but it does amuse me. The one on the right is an example of a really good timeline. It tells you exactly what and when it covers in the title and in the timeline itself, and the relative spacing over time is consistent. Lots of information on this timeline here, if it is information that you are looking for. 
This is a shoe made in 1973 in Italy. It now lives in LACMA or the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and it is here because it makes me smile.